Thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, I am not Brother Tony. And I'm sorry for those of you who are disappointed, but Brother Tony is going down to see that fat rat they call Mickey Mouse. And uh, he asked me if I would stand in for him while he was gone, and I said I will. So I didn't invite myself to the pulpit. I'm doing a favor for him. So uh, I hope that will work out okay for you. Brother Haney, thank you for I asked him if he'd please let the young people stay in tonight because I had something I wanted to say to him. And he did that, and I'm very happy for that. Thank you so much. And I thought I saw Austin. Austin, so good to see you, man. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. Amen. And uh, I, 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 I'm not going to get done, okay? I know I'm not going to get done, but I'm going to try to help you. I, I want to I read two portions of Scripture in your hearing. Psalms chapter 27. Psalms 27. Verse 1, the Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came up, up on me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell, though a host should encamp up against me. My heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord. And that will I seek after. Now, let me just stop for a second and make you understand something. David is asking for something right now that is, that is spiritually and religiously impossible for him to have. He is asking to be a priest who goes into the tabernacle and stands before the presence of the Lord. He is so hungry and desirous of God. He said, one thing I would love to do. I'd love to just be able to go in and stand in the presence of the Lord and behold the beauty of the Lord. He wasn't allowed to do that. He, he just wasn't allowed to do that. He wasn't a part of the Levitical priesthood. So it's just something that he has going on. All the days of my life, behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Psalms, I mean, Psalms 37 and verse 4. Psalms 37, verse 4. Delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And I'll quote the next one, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. Let us hear, therefore, hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every act, whether good or bad, and he's going to bring it into light, he's going to bring judgment upon it. Now, I'm, I'm going to make the very what seems like a brash statement. Solomon was given unbelievable, unrestrained wisdom. His wisdom is not revealed in Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. He has stated his position from his spiritual position. He is not correct. He is not correct. He is stating his position. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. Not so. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you. I want to talk to you about the, the, the greatest battle that we have to fight. The greatest battle that we have to fight. Lord, bless the word and help me to be a blessing and help everybody not to get mad at me. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. John chapter 10. Bob, you're writing down scriptures. John chapter 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. Now, I know I threw you a curve just now. You're like, like as if somehow I'm telling you the Bible's not the truth. Oh, no, the Bible's true. But a lot of things that, that are said in the Bible are not always true because people's opinions say that. Or they saw the, the, the water as if it was blood. Well, that, it wasn't blood. It was just a reflection of the sun. So you have to take it in context. And you have to understand something, that when Solomon is making his little declaration, he's making it from his position. He's getting ready to leave. He's like 57 or 58 years old now, and he is not a spiritual man. He is so unspiritual that he divided the entire kingdom of Israel, and it never recovered. I didn't think I was going to have that much trouble. 
Okay, maybe I'll do it this way and I'll get a little better for you. Here's the greatest battle and the greatest danger that we had. Now, we Pentecostals, we preach against watching this, wearing that, going there, drinking that, smoking that, eating that, fine. That's okay, but that's really not our battle. That becomes our battlefront because we're not handling the other issue. Here's the battle. The greatest danger in our life is when duty replaces desire. There is nothing any more powerful that I'm aware of than the power of desire. Desire can keep you when duty will fail you. Desire can take you beyond where duty can take you. Desire can help you bounce back from your biggest failure, but duty won't do that. Let me try it again. Desire to long for, to crave, to cover, to have a strong craving for, an appetite for. Duty, conduct based on a moral obligation, action required, an obligation, obedience, respect shown to people or rank, requirement to be met, a task required to do that which you're expected. Duty and desire are not the same. Now, uh, I, I wish Brother Tony was here because I know he's probably watching, but I wish he was here because I'd like to talk to him to his face so I don't cause any trouble for his church. But, but I'm going to ask you a question. When you pray, is your motivation duty or desire? When you praise and you sing and you worship, is it duty or desire? Your attendance to the house of God, does it come from duty or does it come from desire? One of the greatest battles that we have in our life is to be able to keep our desire strong, vibrant, and alive. Most of us who have been raised in the Pentecostal arena Duty has a good hold on us, you know. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. Make sure you give your tithing. Make sure you clap your hands and all that stuff. And, and make sure you try to be moral and dress right and all that stuff. That's all duty. I, I, I was praying and, and I felt so strong. I wrote it down here in the bottom of my Bible. It says right here. It says, the backslider does not need to be told the truth. They already know it. What we need to pray for our backslidden children and loved ones is that God would recreate a desire in their lives for what they already know is right. Now, I, I don't know whether I'm going to get anywhere with this or not. The adversary comes to, adversary comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If he can steal or kill, well, watch this. If he can't steal your desire, his next best effort is diminish it. Now, everyone in this building, I, I, if you're going to be honest, you would have to say somewhere along the line in your walk with God, you've gone through seasons when your desire diminished. And you functioned out of duty. You just did it out of duty. But here's the problem. When you do things out of desire, Desire can add a quality to duty that duty doesn't have. If you do your duty without desire being the motivation, you can do it joyless. The reason why some people's praise and worship is yucky is because it's done out of duty, not out of desire. Not of that, that vehement yearning, that hungering, that thirsting, that I want to please God. Now, I know I, I made a very uh, uh, stunning statement in the beginning about Solomon saying that this is the whole duty of man. But you must understand something. That Solomon was raised by a man whose overwhelming power was his desire to please God. 
David was not a perfect man. David didn't have everything all together. He made a lot of mistakes and a lot of blunders. But his desire brought him back from destruction. His desire brought him back from his mistake that he made with Bathsheba. His... There's a great danger when in our lives, unknowingly, we allow duty to replace desire. Well, I'm here, and I'm dressing like this, and I'm giving like that, and I'm clapping like that. I'm doing my duty. You can do your duty without any joy. You can do it. Listen, when you do things out of desire, that impregnates you with expectation. When you do your duty, you just say, well, I'm doing what I was supposed to do, and that was it. And you don't have any expectation. Well, okay. When you and I live for God out of desire, stay with me now, Brother Tony, wherever you are, hold on to your hat. Holy living is no problem. You try to do holy living out of duty, and you can get frustrated. You can challenge. Hello, David. I just realized you were there. Hello, Sister David. Glad to see you. I just realized you were there. So glad to see you. Amen. But, but if you and I try to live for God, holy, righteous, separate, dedicated, committed, godly, and we're doing it out of duty, it won't last very long. Because duty doesn't give you the inspiration that you need. But if there is a hidden desire in your heart, come hell or high water, up and down, in and out, good or bad, I'm going to do my best to please God. That, woo, that desire has the ability to deliver you. It has the ability to make you pray again. It, it has the ability to say, I'm going to get up and try it again. That's, that's really what Micah was saying. Rejoice not against me, O my enemy. For when I fall, I shall arise. And when I see the darkness, the Lord shall be my light. Why? Because I'm full of desire. If you have a hot desire for God, you can overcome bad performance. If you have bad performance, but you only live by God for God by duty, you may not make it back. Well, I thought for sure I had a great Bible study here. I really did. I, I, I really felt like. I have to look at the back door so I don't get anybody upset, but I wonder how many people are here tonight out of duty. And how many are here out of desire. When, when we live for God out of desire, nothing shall offend us. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Nothing will stop us. We may get our feelings hurt. We may have some low times. But when you have desire, you're going to climb back up out of the muddy grubs. You're going to get back out of the low spots. You're going to come through those dark seasons and those valleys because desire has the power to deliver. Now, uh, I hope I can, I can clear up my first statement because I felt like it came back and slapped me in the face about Solomon. Solomon saying, this is the whole duty of man. Well, that was his perspective, but that's not really so. Because duty is not the whole thing for man. Having a living desire is the thing. Because if you do your duty without a desire, you just function. It's like working with employees that just, I work 8 to 5. I punch in, I punch out. They have no desire. They're just doing their job. I don't want to do my job for God and it be joyless. I don't want to do my job for God and it just be a law. That's why I wanted our young people to stay in. You got to hear me. Uh, just hold on. Just, just stay with us. I'm talking to every parent in this house, me included. We parents must not just hand our kids rule books and restraint mechanisms. And we don't wear that. We don't do that. We don't go there. We don't do that. Now, we've got to hand that stuff to our kids because that's part of their duty. But as you give them their duty, we owe them 
the, the power to also create in them a desire for the lawgiver, a desire for Jesus Christ. I think a lot of people from our church would not have backslidden had we emphasized more desire than we did duty. You know, when you're doing your duty for the church and the kingdom and whatever it is, you can only go so long, and after a while, if that desire isn't alive in you, you're leaving. You're gone. You're gone. I'm telling you, I, I was so encouraged when I was praying today. It's like the Lord said, your backsliders are not far from this house. What you need to start doing is get the people to start praying for God to visit them with a desire, to give them a fresh desire, to resurrect their desire. Listen, if you have a desire to live for God, I'm going to make a bold statement. You're unbeatable. If you keep your desire for God alive, I don't care how many times you fall down, you're going to get back up. How many times you fail, you're going to get back up. You keep that desire. You keep that desire burning. How many marriages are suffering because it's duty and not desire? I, 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 I wanted Brother Tony to be here because I'm going to get strong right now. I'm going to get strong right now. There are many in this auditorium that used to want to really please God. You really wanted to be spiritual. You wanted to be an impactor. You wanted to be a soul winner. You wanted to be a Sunday school teacher. You wanted to be in the ministry. You wanted to affect things. You know what happened? You still love God. You still got the Holy Ghost. But somewhere along the line, all of us have suffered from a diminished desire. And you don't even realize it's diminished. Because we go to church all the time, we sing all the time, we pray all the time. But it is, uh, boy, it's, uh, I wish I could put your kissers on that screen right now. You just, how dare you say that my desire is diminished? Oh, I can tell that by your countenance. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He gave us a teaching in the book of Luke. He turned around and he said, which of you have a servant that comes from the field? And the master comes in and the master says, now clothe thyself and feed me first. And after I'm done, you can eat. And he says, does the master therefore say unto him, thank you? And Jesus said, I think not. Why? For then they shall say, we are but unprofitable servants. Watch. For we have only done that which was our duty. God, that makes a small package for any kind of Christian that all we do is our duty because duty is shallow. Duty is... But, but if you have a desire... Uh, I, 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 I'm on the internet. Am I on the internet now? Oh, God, here we go. I've been, I've been allowed to be uh, the honored uh, pastor of this church for 35 or 36 years. I think it was something like that. It was a long time. And I can honestly say that, that in all the years that I've had the privilege to try and pastor you, I never pastored with a sense of duty. Not one time. I never came to this pulpit one time and said, oh, man, I got to give these stupid jerks another sermon. Oh, God, I got I to gotta go to prayer. Room. That has never been that one time. There has always been a desire in me. Man, we need to reach for the Holy Ghost. We need to reach for the Spirit of the Lord. We need to make this church a soul-winning church. We need the gifts of the Spirit. We need an operation and divine intervention of God. And that desire has stayed alive in me all these years. Now, I'm an old guy now, and I don't work here anymore, but you have not been able to steal my desire, and Satan hasn't been able to kill my desire. I still have a desire for the supernatural. I still have a desire for the desire for the unexplainable but the undeniable. I still have a desire for God to just sweep in the house and start throwing his weight around. And the problem with when you live for God at duty, then normal is okay. And natural is fine. As long as there's no trouble. As long as there's no problems, wait a minute. 
You're not going to get the spiritual world to work with you sitting on your duff and saying, I love Jesus. That ain't going to happen, pal. You got to pursue the things of God. You got to reach after the things of God. You got to stretch out for the things of God. You don't just find the stuff of the Spirit because you show up at church. Let me try it again. Do you pray from the, the platform of desire or duty? Well, I'll just help you. I prayed both. There's been times when my desire just seemed low, and I just prayed because I'm supposed to pray. And usually when I pray like I'm supposed to pray, it comes out like you're supposed to. But if I can ever get my desire going and I can ever say, Lord, I'm hungry for you. I'm thirsty for you. I'm stretching for you. There's something that happens. It's almost like an exhilaration. There's like a surge. There's like something that grabs a hold. Come on. You know, you know what we need to do tonight? We need to ask God to revive, renew, and restore our desire for God and the things of God. Now, nobody is telling anybody you're lost and you're hypocrites and you're liars. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying if God would, in his mercy, visit us individually and collectively and start renewing and restoring and reviving our... De Don't you remember when you first got in church? You didn't know much about duty. You didn't know what the laws were, the rules were, anything. You just had this desire. I got to go. I got to be there. Something's going to happen. I know something's going to take place. And we're going to have one of those funny ladies talking in them funny languages, and my hair's going to stand on my head, and I'm going to, whoo. I just, can I get a witness here somewhere? And if you're not careful, you wake up one day, and it's been a long time since you felt that desire. Now, you haven't stopped loving God, and you have not stopped walking with God, and you have not stopped doing the things for God, but just somehow, just maybe, the thief has come, steal, kill, destroy, diminish, deplete. So that instead of desire, well, i got to be at church tonight, 730. See, when you do it out of duty, there's no expectation. When you do it out of desire, it's all expectation. See, Solomon was raised by a father who had an overwhelming passion and drive to please God. Now, I'm going to say this as kindly as I can. You can correct me if you want, but you need to be careful. I personally believe Solomon missed that class. He was raised by a dad whose passion was, I want to please God. I want to love God. I want to hear God's voice. I want to know God. I want to be with him. And somewhere, Solomon was at a coffee shop somewhere or something and missed that class because if you read the rest of his ministry, it was all duty. And when he finished his life, his ministry, he said, the whole thing's about duty. No, it's not. Desire has got eternity in it. But duty that is not motivated by desire will fail. Yeah. Ah, Brother Tony, I wish you was here. Consider what I'm saying. When you have desire, it'll help you do crazy stuff. You ready, Rob? Jacob's got a desire for Rachel. Duty says he's got to go 14 years. He said, piece of cake. And he serves 14 years for this girl that he's mesmerized and in love with. Because when you do things out of desire, duty's a piece of cake. Let me try it again. Our young people, listen to me. You've got to ask God to create a desire in you for the things of God. If not... Holiness standards, righteous living, separation unto God is going to wear thin after a while. You can't just live for God because it's the right thing to do. No. 
No, there has to be this desire, has to be this passion, has to be this drive, has to be something that keeps you going. Man, that old saying, you know, when things get going tough, the tough get going, you know. Sometimes you just got to go. I just, I go a lot of times just at a desire. I, I've got a desire alive in me, now, all around me. All hell's breaking loose. Things are happening. I, hey, Phil, I wish you'd have been me the other day. You could have had a heart attack with me. I drove my, my nice car down 53rd Avenue, and my wife and I were in the car, and all of a sudden, in five seconds, it went, and the whole windshield was covered, and I thought a tree fell on the car, and my hood had blown up. Destroyed the whole front of the car, ruined the hood, ruined everything, broke the whole windshield out. Scared me. <laughs> Stepped on the brake, slid over the side of the street. I was so glad there wasn't a lady with a baby or somebody in a bicycle or something. I said, what in the world happened? I look out there and here's my hood on top of the front of my car. It just blew out. And I said, oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's so scary. My wife was like two days. <laughs> we thought a tree fell on the windshield. We couldn't figure out what in the world happened. Just, <laughs> just, just stay with me. I, I know what I'm talking about. You see, if you're not careful, duty runs your life like the Pharisee. And the Pharisee's motto was, what do I have to do? The Rebecca spirit, which is the bride spirit, says, what can I do for you? See, you young people, listen to this old guy. There's a big difference between I gotta and I wanna. Don't hang around all these people around here that always got the mully grubs and the criticism said, I got to, I got to. Get away from stupid people like that. Find somebody in this auditorium that says, I want to. I want to bless him. I want to praise him. I want to love him. I want to worship him. I want to be godly. I want to be holy. I want to support the church. I want to be. Listen, when you and I are motivated by desire, faithfulness is a piece of cake. I am firmly convinced the only reason some people don't live for God who have learned the truth is because they lost their desire. Or we parents didn't give it to them. We gave them the rule book. We gave them don't do this, don't do that, don't go there, watch that, be careful. Blah, blah, blah. Fine. And there was nothing wrong with giving them the rule book. But maybe some, just maybe we failed to introduce to them the desire to know the one who owned the book. Listen to me. Your relationship is not with the book. It's with the author. If you have a relationship with the author, the book is easy. If you don't have a relationship with the author, the book is hard. Is this the church I used to pass? I just, I'm not used to the living dead here. Am I telling you the truth, Alana? I'm telling you the truth. There's something about, I don't care how many mistakes we made, how many wrong decisions we made, how many stupid things we've done. If you have a desire for the things of God, you're unstoppable. You're unbeatable. I didn't say you won't fail or you won't fall or you won't make some mistakes, but I'm telling you that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Nothing's going to damn you and condemn you. Nothing's going to separate you from the love of God. If you can keep your desire for God alive. Now, I don't, I don't mean to be rude to some of you right now, but I know the audience that I'm talking to, some of you have had your feelings hurt. Some of you have experienced disappointments. Now, I'm not saying you didn't deserve the bad feelings that you're feeling, that that you should, you got the short end of the stick, okay. But don't let that bum beat you in the head with the stick. Well, I, I didn't get a fair shake. Okay, fine. Okay, now what are you going to do about it? Well, I'm just going to live for God out of duty. I'll pay my tithes and, and I, you know, I, I hate going around this church and dealing with sour pussies. I hate it. I've hated it from my first day. I hate it now. And, we, and, and the really, most of the sourpusses I talk to are the older people. 
They've been in Pentecost so long that they were in Pentecost before Pentecost was. And it's just like, you know, they just sour, 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 sour. I'm so sick of it, sour. Listen, if you and I do not have a desire for the things of God, we cannot grow. We'll be in duty and you maintain. You don't grow in duty, you maintain. But if you have a desire, you can experience the mysteries of God. You can experience the deep things of God. You can experience levels in the Holy Ghost that no person living by duty. You can have a joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. You can have an ecstasy in your life that says, I know it's raining, but the sun's going to shine. I know it's dark, but the sun's coming out. I know I made up a mistake in this one, but I am coming out of this. Why? Because hell can't stop your desire. Don't let hell replace your desire with duty. Replace your desire with duty. That's the greatest battle we have. It's not dress codes. It's not movies. It's not honky-tonk. It's not chewing tobacco. That's all side issues. The whole issue is you and I have got to learn how to maintain the desire in our life so it stays strong. Your desire and my desire for God must be stronger than your sense of duty. See, I got a house full right now. You're sitting here. I can pick you out real easy. You live by duty. You live by duty. That's why you have no joy. You live by duty. Well, I'm sure you'll probably be saved, but hopefully I won't move in with you when I get there. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Marty, am I telling the truth? Yeah. Is it the whole issue? It's not about doctrine. Okay, Bob, ready? You're going to write this? You preach this all over the world. You ready? Here we go. It is totally spiritually impossible to inherit desire. You can inherit duty. You can inherit doctrine. You can inherit customs. You can inherit traditions. You can inherit ritual. But you cannot inherit desire. That must be birthed. That must be developed. That must. <laughs> you no more can inherit desire than you can inherit relationship. You can inherit ritual, but you cannot inherit a relationship. A relationship must be worked at. It must be developed. It must be grown. It must be fed. You cannot inherit desire. And we do our people a great injustice when we tell them to live with duty and we don't ever give them desire. I know I'm talking. I don't know if I'm talking to anybody, but I'm talking. It's so mind-boggling to me. You can't, Carol, you can't inherit desire. See, when we get our kids to come in Pentecost or newcomers come in, we give them the doctrine, we give them the lifestyle, we give them the rule book, we give them church culture, we, we give them what we want to give them, and there's nothing wrong with that, fine. But we can't give them desire. And if desire is not born in them and developed, or they do not reach to God and say, Lord, create in me a desire. Somehow do something in me so that I will stick, so I will grow, so I will learn. We are doing a great injustice to our older people and our younger people if we're not dealing with them about desires. And it, it, I'm going to tell you what, it's a battle. It takes work to keep your desire alive. Because when negative things happen to you, they become detractions to you. When hurtful things happen, they become detractions to you. I, I wrote notes on the back of my page here. I, I don't need to look at it because I wrote it. I said after pastoring this church 35 or 36 years, I can honestly say, I have never pastored this church out of a sense of duty, not once. This has not one time been to me a job. This to me has been a joy. 
This to me has been a challenge. This to me has been an inspiration. Every time I've come to this pulpit, whether I preached well or I didn't preach well, I preached the best I could. It was in my heart saying I had a desire. Somebody's going to grab a hold of this. Somebody's going to get the Holy Ghost. Somebody's going to get encouraged. Somebody's going to get healed. Somebody's going to get their life turned around. It wasn't about duty. It was desire. That's why church has always been wonderful to me. And I, and I, and I just want to say this. And pastor's not here. I just have to tell you, thank you. Thank you. I, maybe I didn't say it before. 35, 36 years, you allowed me to try. You allowed me to, to pastor. But, but, but even with your negativity and even with your worldliness and even with your carnality and with your spirituality and your victories, you have inspired me and challenged me and helped me to keep my desire alive. I came here tonight. I have a desire alive. I'm traveling all over this nation now. I'm, I'm going everywhere. I so, said, well, I'm not pastoring here anymore I, I'm, I'm not here anymore but 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 I'm not dead some people I'm preaching say I'm preaching better than I ever did in my whole life man I'm I land on that thing I said let's go I'm ready I got a desire I want people to get healed I want people to get saved I want people to turn around I, I, and, and I will not let negative things and bad things and failures in people's lives steal from me, my, me, my desire. And I refuse to allow the adversary to replace my desire with a sense of duty. They're not the same. And you kids, listen to the old man. You've got to ask God to create in you a yearning and a desire of I want to. Now, when you're growing up, your parents dragged you to church all the time. Fine. You got to. But there comes a time when you get in your life where you start making decisions. You got you to gotta trade that I got to for I want to. Thirty-six years, Daryl. I ain't never walked to this pulpit one time and said, oh, man, do I got to preach again? Now, Carrie used to say to me sometimes, and she was right and I was wrong, I would sit there and I'd be studying, moving my Bible, reading the choir, singing, and I'm thinking, I'm not paying attention to that. I'm, ready, I'm getting ready to work. I'm, in my mind, I'm going, I wish you'd get out of the way. I got something to say. <laughs> and I remember one time she, she was so kind, she said to me, Pastor, you know, you're sitting over there thumbing through your Bible and you're looking. I said, well, I'm getting ready to preach. She said, yeah, but the choir's singing their heart out and they're and it was kind of like she was very kind, just went. And I said, thank you. I needed that. Thank you very much. And I put my Bible down, and I worshiped with the choir. And I said, okay, fine. We'll just clap. And we'll just do what we can, and I'll be okay. But I, I've, never, I've never been over here like this. Do I got to? They didn't listen to me last time. Well, that's not too bad. They didn't listen to Jesus either. He just kept preaching. He just kept teaching. And when they didn't want him in their neighborhood, he said, no problem. I'll go find me another neighborhood. I, I, I'll go somewhere. Let me try it again. I know you haven't humor at my expense. But what about all the times when you're sitting on the pew and you're sitting next to people that are dead? They're so dead they smell they're so dead. And wh why don't you worship? Why are you letting them shut you down? Where's your desire? When you come to church, you ought to turn around and say, I got to touch him. I got to reach him. I got to feel him. I got to hear him. Woo! I, I got to have something from God. And even if you're in a service and you don't get what you are hoping and desiring to get, you need to walk out with a desire. He's still the king. He's still the Lord. He still knows where I am, and I'm going to come through this. I will. Somebody needs to say that to me. I'm going to come through this. I'm coming out of this. I don't know how. I don't know when, but I will come out of this. I am not going to serve God with the dimension of duty.
Ryan, you cannot play that instrument and lead this music just with a sense of duty. Now, you got a duty to do it, but your duty ought to come out of desire. When you come up and you say, I'm going to play, I'm going to put the music together, we're going to have a move of God, things are going to happen. There ought to be something in all of you right now, wherever you sit, you're sitting among the living dead, set it on fire. Set it on you got sitting next to somebody who don't worship God, kick them out and make them sit on the ground. Say, get away from me, fool. I got things to do. I'm telling you, man, if you can get your desire going, hell can't stop you. If you can keep your desire alive, hell can't stop you. But if you live for God out of duty, you can live frustrated, joyless lives. You, you can sit down. Do you hear me, Monica? You back there in the Jeeps, you can hear me okay? You hear what I'm saying? This, this is serious stuff. This is, see, this is the biggest battle. Our battle is not putt-putt golf and skinny dipping and internet and dirty movies and all that. That's not our battle. That only becomes our battle when the level of our desire diminishes. You give me somebody who's got a hot desire for God, Holiness ain't no trouble. Modesty ain't, oh, I wish I could get it. Modesty ain't no trouble. Righteous living ain't no trouble. But when our desire diminishes, let me, let me say this to you. If you and I do not let God satisfy our desires for him, and we live out of duty, here's what it is. We will find someplace else to satisfy our desire. See, I'm not, you think I'm against your internet antichrist stuff. I'm not against it. Play all your games all you want to. That's your business. I'm just telling you, I'm watching something happen in this whole Pentecostal movement. More and more churches are having less and less church. You know what that is? It's not a time factor. It's a diminished desire. We're cutting our doctrines down. This is not important. That's not important. I'm not sure Acts 2.38 is the new birth. I'm not, whoa, 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 whoa. You know what? They need to get back to the altar. They need to get the heart on fire again. They need to rekindle themselves. Don't let any devil replace desire with a sense of duty. There's more to this than just meeting your duties. I'm going, no, I want you to stand for a second. I just, I need about a 60 second. To, David, sit down. You just stay right there. You're my guest. You just stay right there. I want to rest. I need about 120 seconds of clapping hands. You ain't going to steal my desire. You're not going to replace my desire with a sense of duty. The whole duty of man is a lot more than just keeping the book. The whole duty of man is to keep his desires on fire for God. Yeah, yeah. Sit down a second. Sit down. Sit down just a second. Thank you. Now, now, now you answer me, please. And, and I'll try to answer me without embarrassing you. Is there anybody besides me that you've gone through low spells when your desire was greatly diminished, almost disappeared out of duty? And thank God that you functioned out of duty, but there was no joy. There was no expectation. There was no ecstasy. There was no... Listen, it is possible, whether in the natural world or the spirit realm, that you and I can do our jobs, duty, joyless. Sourpuss. I'm not saying we have to be happy, clappy, loony, goony, wacko people. I'm not trying to say that at all. But I'm just saying, the joy of the Lord is your strength. With joy shall you draw waters out of the wells of salvation you know sometimes i think you people had the ropes on your bucket cut 
You can't drop it down in the well. You need to drop that bucket down and get it up again. Maybe we need to pick up, I, I know I'm not picking on you, Ryan, but we need to pick up some of those old Pentecostal songs when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. He brought me out of the miry clay. He set my feet on the rock to stay. When I first came in, Marty, I didn't know what was up, what was down, when to clap, when to stand, but God created a desire in me even though I didn't have a lot of understanding, I had a desire that I wanted to know God. I wanted to hear God. I wanted to walk with God. I'm 73 years old. I've been preaching 45 years, thousands and thousands of sermons. My desire is as strong now as it was when I first started. I'm like Caleb, man. I ain't lost my vim of vigor. I'm ready to go. I think the greatest days for this church are ahead of us right now. I think God's going to use this new man to take this place to a new level in God. But we need to ask God to renew and revive our desires. I'm almost, I'm almost done. I know Brother Tony usually finishes 30 minutes, although my wife said he's been going 45 lately. So I'm, I'm at 35 right now. I'll just finish in just a second. said, uh, David failed God. And he got himself involved with Bathsheba. We know the story. But he writes Psalm 51, and, and he still has a desire. Wait a minute. Though he's been defeated... Though he's been ashamed, though he's in, he is embarrassed, he is humiliated, okay? The prophet has said, thou art the man. I mean, his, he's got egg all over his face. But his desire was not stolen by the adversary. Because even though he made a wrong choice and a wrong decision, he still went back to God. Psalms 51, you got 51? Come on, read. Oh, 51. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward, inward parts. parts. Thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Go ahead. And in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Yes. Perch me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Wait a minute. You can't pray that kind of prayer if your desire has been taken. Because there's lots of people that fall down, and there's lots of people that make wrong choices. And the only reason they don't get back up is because somehow the adversary has either replaced their desire with duty or just stolen their desire. Is there anybody besides yours truly that you have ever fallen down since you've lived for God and you got back up? Do you, do you understand? You know, we, we preach a lot Luke 15. I'll be there in a minute. Now, we preach a lot Luke 15 about the prodigal son and all that stuff. But do you understand that the prodigal, his performance was pathetic? It was horrendous. It was awful. And yet it didn't kill his desire. He said, I'm going back to the farm and I'm going back to the father. But he had an elder brother on the farm who didn't live for his daddy by desire. He lived by duty. That's why he was a stupid nincompoop. He was an idiot. He was a dummy to work on the farm all the time and never enjoy his father and never enjoy what he was doing because every day I work eight to five. I go in the field. I punch the clock. I come back. I'm a good boy. I do my duty. Man, listen, God is not so much interested in us doing our duty as he is in us letting have a desire to burn in our hearts to become more like him, to draw closer to him, to hear his voice, to know his thoughts. Now, I'm not, I'm not putting a blanket out here so you can live like any stupid fool. I didn't say that. I'm just saying it, you better watch out that you put such an emphasis on duty and none on desire. Because the adversary is sly, old fox. And if he can, he'll slip up and, are you hearing me, Mel? He'll replace your desire with duty. Well, I come to church. 
yeah, here's my money. I, I put a check in and I paid my tithes and, and, I, and I meet some of the stands of the church. Duh! And hell's afraid of you as much as ice cream Paul is in hell. Why? Because people who just do their duty are dumb. Spiritually dumb. Well, I come to church and I dress right and I live right and I don't go here and I don't go there and I don't do this and I don't do that. I'm glad you don't. Good for you. You're, you're doing a good job. Where's your desire? Oh, I traded that a long time ago for complaint. You ready for this? You better be careful because sometimes compliance is a good way to hide resistance. It's a good way to hide resentment. It's a good way to hide anger and bitterness. I comply. I had a bunch of stuff I wanted to give to you, but I'm almost out of time already. Here's your homework assignment. Go home and just read chapter 1, 2, and part of 3 of Malachi. And the Lord makes a complaint to Malachi. And he talks to about his whole nation. He said, you people have spoken evil and hard words towards me. Why? What have we said about you? He said, you said the table of the Lord's contemptible. What? Now watch. I'm going to paraphrase it. When you read those five different verses, here's what he says. Living for God's a pain in the neck. I got smart, important things to do, not that stupid church stuff. And he said, you bring in sacrifices in there, second rate, and you bring in torn stuff. And if you gave it to your governor, he'd laugh you out of the court. And he said, you give me stuff that's left over instead of the best stuff, and then you want me to bless it. Read it. Malachi 1 is a terrifying scripture. He says, I have no pleasure in you. That's got to be the worst thing God could ever say to any person that's supposed to be a religious person. I have no pleasure in you. Why? Because you have no pleasure in me. He said, the day of the Lord's a bore. The church services are a pain. I hate this church stuff. I hate, listen, my folks, you better ask God to keep you away from ever thinking that church is a drag, that church is a bore. This is the greatest thing this side of glory. This is the body of Christ. This is, ah, this is the kingdom of the Lord that God is trying to work. This is the bride. I didn't say that sometimes you don't come to church, Michael, and you're dragging, and you're picking low cotton, fine, and you're tired, and you got more aches and pains than you can come up with, fine. But the desire coals are still there. Sometimes my desires have not burned like a big flame, but they never went out. That's why I thank God for singing and praising and choir and music. Because sometimes when I was there and, and my desire, it was there, but it was low. Man, they'd get to worship it and you folks get to worship it. And all of a sudden, it was like the wind of God went. And all of a sudden, that thing blew up and burned out. And I said, I'm ready to go again. Oh, praise God. Somebody shout back at me. I'm not going to let the devil. Steal my desire. Steal my desire. Woo. You ain't going to make it to New Jerusalem out of duty. You're going to make it to New Jerusalem out of a desire that says nothing's going to separate me from the love of God. Nothing's going to stop me from getting to the city where the Lamb is the light. I'm going to overcome. Yeah. Read for me, Rev. I'm trying to close right now. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Right, said, I need to hear some joy. Every once in a while, some of the best saints of God get a little low on joy. So you got to drop the bucket in and get some joy out. And if your ropes are broke, borrow your neighbor's. You're laughing like I'm stupid or something. But I, I, I've been here a long time. There's certain spots in this church, man, are scary. There's some places in this church assembly that are deep freezes. There's some of them are so cold, they don't even hang meat there. Some of the places there are so cold, hell won't go there because he'd get a cold. And there's other places you go to that seem like no matter what happens, they're always 
Hey. Sometimes you just need to do a little shuffle on the pew. We need a spillover blessing. Don't sit next to some old crank and some old griper and some complainer. Get yourself next to somebody who's got a little bit of fire in them and get encouraged. I'm almost done. Thank you for listening. Is that you, Larry? Am I doing good? I'm not doing no good. Okay, you're throwing a tomato. I got you. Go ahead. Read. Hide thy face from my sins and blow out all my iniquities. Come on. Create in me. Wait a minute. That's what ready, Robbie? Come on, me and you. That's all we got to do. If a man who is a man after God's own heart, who sometimes failed God, but he kept his desires, but now his desire is low, he said, you know what, Lord? I'm just burning a little low right now. Create in me a clean heart. Renew in me a right spirit. Sometimes that's the best prayer that you and I could ever pray, to just ask God to just, to just create it in me, revive me, set my soul on fire. I'm not talking about emotional mumbo jumbo. I'm talking about just really having your desire aflame. Create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit. Go ahead. Cast me not away from Whoa, thy presence. Wait, wait a minute. Here's a guy that's down, committed adultery, murdered a guy, lived like a fool, was a hypocrite. He turned around. Watch. Here's how you can tell if you got desire. If in your worst moment you can turn around and say, don't throw me away. Don't, don't cast me away. Woo! I guarantee you, when God heard David say that, God went. And the fire started burning again because he said, said, then will I teach transgressors thy ways. Then will I become the witness I need to be. I'm in a low spot right now. I've somehow made a mess, but Lord, please breathe on my desire. Because if you can keep your desire strong, you can overcome anything. Okay, I'm almost done. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend. You're very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What kind of, what kind of marriage are you going to have if, if you function out of duty and not desire? Do I got to kiss you? Do I got to romance you? Couldn't we just play Uno? Could you imagine somebody getting married? And I got him up here getting ready, ready to say I do. And she turns around and says, do I got to kiss her? You must be kidding. You just get out there and go. Let me try it again. I know it's, it's not a great theological point, but it helps me a lot. You got to learn how to go from I got to to I want to. I got to to I wanna. I gotta is duty. I wanna is desire. Now, I'm not saying we don't need to do our duty. We do need to do our duty. But duty ought to come out of desire and not be replacing desire. I think I'm finishing. Yeah, I think I'm done. Let's hear the whole duty of man. The whole duty of man is not just to keep his commandments, fear God and keep his commandments. That was his, that was his perspective. That's what he said. It's good advice. But you understand that his life was measured up never by desire. He never had any kind of real desire for the things of God once he built the temple. He just did all this women stuff and he did all this horses stuff. and He, did, he split the kingdom. It never came back together. His children were wackos. Why? Because he measured everything by duty. Man, listen. You don't want to measure your walk with God by duty. There are things that are duty. We have to do certain things. But let him be born out of desire. The battle we face right now is the adversary wants to replace our desire with a sense of duty. Well, I pay my tithes. Well, I dress modest. I'm keeping myself clean. Well, that's good. I'm glad you're doing all that. But 
But how many hundreds of people come to churches with no desire? When we walk in that back door, we ought to come here saying, hmm, something's fixing to happen. Man, I don't know, boy. I, a choir's going to throw down today. Tony's going to... Tony's going to flip out and jump up on the pulp and grab a rope and swing across the pot. Something great's going to happen. You watch. God, God's going to just make bare his mighty arm. Listen, you, you show me somebody that has a desire, no matter how many times they failed, how many times they made a mistake, I'll show you somebody that hell can't stop. So I'm going to ask you before I leave. So now, are you living for God by duty or desire? Do you desire to hear his voice? Do you desire to walk with him? Do you desire to please him? That's it. I don't care what anybody says about backsliders and people that walked away. No, I don't get all the baloney they want to give out why they're not living for God. No, I, I can put it in one thing. Lost your desire. Blame this, blame that, blame this. Do what you want to. No, no. You keep your desire to please God alive. Hell can't beat you. Quarter tail. I, got, I guess I have to stop. Why don't I, I, my wife says stop. Okay, let's go. We'll stop. Okay. We'll stop. Amen. Don't you get it? Phil, if you and I live without a desire, you know what we do? We live mediocre, mundane, blasé, Christian lives. How many times have I told this church, the problem with the mediocre is they're always at their best. That's a shame. Just to get by. I don't want to get by. I've been, I, I, I've been doing this a long time and I still haven't found that place in God that I'm wanting. I am still haven't seen the supernatural at the level that I want to see it. And I, and I, and I know it's there. And so it's like that. What do you think kept Paul? You think because he was a great preacher? I don't think Paul was a great preacher. I guarantee he, he couldn't get elected to one of our churches in Pentecost today because he wasn't a pulpiteer. He was a minister. He was a missionary. He, his, his ministry was, I came not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in power and demonstration of the Spirit, that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. He said, I know I don't preach real good, Watch Jesus throw his weight around. <laughs> and the blind saw and the crippled walk and the deaf heard and the dumb spoke. And he goes. And when he gets the Melita and they snake, snake bite him and he throws it off and they call him a murderer. He turns around and starts laying his hands on everybody, heals everybody in the whole island. I guarantee you he, didn't, he couldn't sell ten tapes. He was no pulpiteer. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry I, I didn't help you out. Did Patty, where are you, Patty? I didn't hurt nobody, right? I did, okay. I got instructions from the redhead. Behave. <laughs> didn't you? You told me, behave. Be nice. Don't beat up on anybody. Be kind. Thirty-five years. You've allowed me to love you. And I have loved you. And you've loved me and you love my wife and my daughter. And I'm grateful and thankful to you. And I just, I, I, I don't know what else to say, but please ask God in your own life to possibly revive, restore, renew, recover the level of your desire. I didn't say you were lost or ungodly or hypocrites. Just could it be that maybe unknowingly we've allowed the adversary to trick us so that our, our desire has been replaced by doing our duty and they're not the same. Father, thank you for this wonderful church. Thank you for the message that I feel you gave me and I know I didn't I didn't do as good as I hoped, but anyway, uh, God bless him and
pray that you'll help me and help all of us, that we would take it to heart, that, Lord, that we would not look at church as a bummer and a pain and a problem, and that, and that we would have our desires alive in God, and that you would refresh us and renew us. Please help us. I don't want to be a Pharisee that lives my life and say, what do I got to do? I want that bride spirit. What would you have me do? Bless us together in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. Shake hands. It's 10 minutes to 9. Run.